Okay, so Hi everyone, I'm Mara and with me is Ibrahim. Both of us, inshallah, are going to give you the past session today, which is basically practice questions and we care about you getting the benefit uh, like to the ultimate best. If you guys have any questions, please interrupt us throughout any time, okay? So let's start with our first question. Before we start, uh, I want to tell you guys, this is a learning tool. So if you get the question wrong now, it's fine. This means you will not get it wrong in the final or midterm, whatever test you have. So now you can practice, you can get mistakes, you can learn. But later, you won't find this in the, during the exam, right? It's just one question, yes or no. And inshallah, it'll be great. So please guys have the freedom to read a question for some time so that we'll solve it together. So already know basically the correct answer is D. Uh, now let's get let's get to read the question together. So basically, an investigator is studying the reaction of mutated voltage gated potassium channel. And as we know in this figure, basically the potassium is mostly found over here. Like most of the potassium gated and, and uh, a normal action potential is going to be all the way over here where the voltage gated potassium channels will open. Tamam. So basically, it says over here the medication that this patient is taking alters the uh, potassium conductance. So the uh, so the only thing that's going to be affected here in the figure in the action potential is basically the letter D. Let's come to review the whole action potential now. What happens in letter A? What usually opens in letter A? What do you guys think? The sodium channels begin to open. Exactly, bravo. The sodium, exactly. <laughs> so the sodium channels begins to open all the way to actually the fire potential, and we can have, along with it, the calcium channels open all the way till we reach the peak. After that, once we have the depolarization, repolarization is going to happen. Now, this repolarization needs sodium gated channels to open, and the potassium and the sodium, uh, like, uh, potassium channels will open during repolarization. Sodium and calcium is going to begin to close. So because of that, once this patient has uh, like changes in the potassium conductance channels, basically the letter D is going to be affected. Is it crystal clear to everyone? And then after repolarization, we usually have a hyperpolarization. Okay, so any questions so far? Exactly, we can call it exactly funny channels. Yes, correct. Yes, any questions so far, guys? Or let's go to the next. Crystal clear? Okay. Uh, just so you know, guys, uh, she has questions first, so we're going to go, she's going to do her part first, have the questions, and I'm going to tell you the other part. Yes. And that's due to some time it happened, you know. Yes. Okay, so basically your answers are correct. Guys, inshallah, we're going to share with you the presentation after the, like, the session, so that you have the freedom to read the explanation of uh, the correct answers, as well as the wrong answers, okay? So as we said, that really is going to be the correct answer, because this is where the repolarization happens and the sodium-gated uh, the the potassium gated channels are gonna open. Okay, now let's move to the next question. Kindly read it.
Okay, guys, what do you think is the answer? Guys, is my voice clear right now? Can you hear it better, guys? Yes. Okay. okay amazing. So, what do you, what do you guys think is the answer of this question? It's very similar to the previous question. What do you, any guesses? Okay. Some people are saying calcium. The mom. Other guesses? I just saw the question. Yeah. Any other guesses? Potassium. The mom. Bravo. Excellent. Okay. Basically, the answer is uh, potassium, so it's uh, voltage-gated potassium channels. Now, let's get to read the question together. You know, guys, even before you're reading the question, uh, by seeing the action potential itself, basically, the difference between this action potential and the previous action potential is that this one is action potential of any part of the body, for example, like the muscle. Because this action potential is the cardiac action potential. Because of that, it's a little bit different, but it's the exact same thing. Over here, the sodium channels are going to open. And then over here, the potassium channels are going to open. Okay, so it's the exact same idea. Now, in this patient, we, in this figure, basically, it shows us this is a normal thing. It starts all the way from here. The action potential depolarization starts. And then depolarization starts with this with this line. So this is the normal action potential that happens in the heart, uh, in, the heart in the cardiac muscle. Now, what happens is basically this abnormal thing. This extra line that's affected over here is the abnormal thing. So what is being shifted? Is it the depolarization or repolarization in this figure? Exactly, repolarization, bravo. So what, which, uh, which one is responsible for repolarization? Is it the sodium or the potassium or the calcium? What do you guys think? Exactly, bravo, potassium channels, bravo. So let's review everything. We said during depolarization, sodium channels open. Along with it, calcium can open. Well, us now it's clear. In regards to depolarization, what opens the potassium channels open, right? Right, and the sodium as well as the calcium close this during repolarization so that potassium channels can open. Clear, guys? Clear, amazing. Now, since you already answered the question, we, only by looking with, uh, to the figure without even looking to the question, so this actually like helps you to uh, decrease the amount you spend in the exam, in, uh, for example, in one uh, MCQ question. So this is like one of the helpful tools. You can actually just look at the figure immediately. If you had an idea what's going on, pause, put the answer, and just make sure, like, you just skim the question very fast. Now, in regards to this question, it's not really so clear that, that the answer is uh, voltage-gated potassium channels, but by looking on the figure, like, it's just hey, crystal clear that this is the answer, tamam? So just say it over here that the patient has dizziness, the like, intermittent episodes of the heart palpitation, uh, ECG showed P wave, like, blah, blah, blah. It's not really clear what's supposed to, like, what the hell is going on. So just the figure is, like, the only thing that really makes it very clear. Tamam? Is, every, is everything clear to now? Amazing, mashallah. Okay, so this is the answer and this is the explanation. Okay, let's move to this question. Super easy. What do you guys think is the answer? Tamam, bravo. Any guesses? Excellent. Yes, salam alaykum. Mashallah. Exactly, exactly. You all guys are correct. So basically, actin and myosin protein are related with what? Actin and myosin are basically the filaments responsible for contraction. Any contraction, for example, like muscle contraction, right? So this, those are like the basic. Uh, fundamental units for the contraction of, uh, of nor neural contraction of muscles. So let's review a little bit about acta and myosa. So as you can see in this figure, this, first of all, we have, this is part of a muscle, and then we have over here, uh, this pinkish line, as well as this purple line. Now this pinkish line at the middle, we have something known as the M line. And at the end of the, uh, this purple line, we have Z line over here, or Z disc, as well as the Z disc over here. So we have two Z discs as well as one M line. 
Now, in regard to the meiosin, it's not as the thin filament, thick filament, or meiosin. So we have over here thick filament or meiosin. And this actin from the word like actin, so it's like a very mini thing. Once contraction is going to happen, both actins from this side, from the left side, as well as the from the right side, from the left, as well as from the right side, should come all the way close together till it approximately touches the M line. Now, once this thing happens, it means that the muscle is totally contracted. And once both actins uh, like come across to the middle to the M line and then goes all the way back to, the, to its normal places, like it's uh, in this figure, that means it's relaxation. So this is a very quick explanation of how um, contraction and relaxation of the muscle happens. Crystal clear? Yes, everyone? Amazing. Okay, so let's come to the ECG. So Rahayani, you guys are taking ECG in first year. This is something amazing, to be honest, because this level is ECG of third year. As you are, mashallah, already smart. So let's just review very fast. So basically, this is an ECG strip. I'll just explain the, this figure uh, like briefly so that you guys understand what's going on, and then we can answer it together. Yeah? Because I personally feel that this level is a little bit high for first year medical students. Now, this is an ECG strip where you can find anywhere in the hospital, literally anywhere near or outside Saudi Arabia, anywhere. This is the actual. Normal ECG strip. Now, this ECG strip has lead one over here, lead one, lead two, and lead three. Come on. And basically, we have over here AVR, AVL, and AVF. We have over here V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Every ECG strip should have should have all of those components. Come on. In regards to V1 to V6, this is how we usually put it on the Patients just you usually put a lead over here. This lead is V1, V2, V3, 4, 5, and 6. Come on. And the normal axis of the heart, since the heart is like in the left side, a little bit to the mediastinum, so it's both like mediastinum and left side. So the axis of the heart moves like this, in this way, come on, to the left side. So it's mostly like crossing lead, uh, lead number four. Come on. So basically, I got you this picture to imagine where actually we put V1, V2, V3, uh, V4, V5, and V6. Come on. Now, the most important thing when we usually read an ECG is lead two. Like lead two HIC is like the most important thing we usually look at is the clue of everything in most of the uh, like most of the cases or most of the times. Come on. So basically, over here, we want to comment on the rate and the rhythm and the axis. Now, in regards to the rate, normally an individual uh, individual's uh, heart rate uh, in one minute is how like how many beats per minute? The average it's sixty two. What do you guys think? Exactly sixty two hundred. Bravo. So usually, if the heart rate is sixty two hundred, that means it's a normal uh, normal heart rate. If it's less than sixty, it is what bradycardia, right? What about if it's more than hundred? It's known as the yeah, salam alaikum, mashallah, exactly, so as the tachycardia. So if I want to calculate the rate, as we said, the most important thing is to look at lead two. It's the, like if I, if I have an ECG, look at lead two, plus. it gives me the answer of most of the like uh, case. Now, if I want to calculate the rate, of, for example, this ECG, what do you think, guys, is the rate? First of all, I look at lead two, and then I'll calculate between the RR interval, big boxes, like how many boxes you have, for example, one, two, three, four. So we're going to do all this, 300 divided by the big boxes. You can take big boxes between, for example, the first RR interval over here, or this interval, or this interval. You can even actually take lead one interval, lead three. Approximately all of them are going to be the same. But as we said, like two is the most accurate one, lead two is the most accurate. So we usually like to calculate the, um, for example, the rate, rhythm, axis, anything from lead two. So now if we, for example, divided 300 over four, the answer is going to be what? Yeah. Exactly, exactly, like something, exactly. So is this a normal heart rate or not? It is a normal heart rate because it's between 60 and 100. Come on. So we calculated the rate. Do you think that the rhythm of this heart, uh, of, the, of this ECG is normal? Yes or no? Exactly, yes. Why? We usually look at the P wave, Q, R, S, and T. So for example, we have over here P, somewhere over here, Q, R, S, and T. Normal, P, Q, R, S, T. Normal, P, Q, R, S, T. So this pattern actually looks normal. It doesn't look like haphazard, you say like there's something abnormal. So the rhythm is normal. This is how we say, like, how we comment on the uh, rhythm. Now, in regards to the axis, we usually look at lead number two. As you said, lead number two is really very important. Exactly, bravo, it's a normal axis. Lead number two and AVF. To comment on the axis, we look at lead number two and AVF. Now we look at lead number two in the QRS complex. It's all the way pointing to the above, right? Like it's going up. And in regards to the AVF, the QRS complex is also going to the above. So like it's positive. If it's heading like to the above, it means it's positive. 
if it's going all the way down, which is abnormal, it means it's negative. So in regards to this ECG, it's a normal ECG. Why? Because deep two and AVF, both QR both QR conflicts are going to the above. That means both of them are positive, lead two as well as AVF. So if both of them are positive, that means it's going to the normal, uh, normal direction of the heart, which is all the way in like so it's normal axis, for example, it's all the way heading to the lead number three or four, like it's going all the way downwards. It's not going masculine to the up lateral or the left lateral or the, like it's going all the way downwards. Is this point clear or no? It's a little bit confusing, but I just want to make sure you guys understand. It does. Mashallah. Clear, Mashallah. Okay, amazing. Any questions so far? Any other questions? Questions, guys, or amazing. So, as we said, this uh, ECG is basically a normal ECG, and this is how the leads look like in regards to V1, V2, V3, V4, 5, and 6. Moving next. Okay, so who would like to answer this question? Allah, guys, all your answers are actually correct. It's basically 50. Now, in regards, to, let's, let's explain it. Now, in regards, for example, now the heart, the left ventricle has some amount of blood. Approximately in total, it's 120. Now, once the heart pumps the blood all the way to the aorta, approximately 70 milli goes to the aorta. So once the left, the left is 50 milli. And this 50 milli is known as the end, what? End, solid volume, come on. So is it clear? This is basically just a bonus question. Okay, let's move next. Okay, now in regards to the cardiac cycle, who is confused with the cardiac cycle? Let's just be honest with each other. I tend to explain it. What exactly confuses you in the cardiac cycle to focus more on it? Exactly, the one in the York is a script volume, you're correct. So what's your confusion, guys, in the stroke volume and the uh, cardiac cycle? I think for Hazrat Allah, everything is so clear. Awesome. Okay, let's review it very fast. So basically, let's start with the ECG or the electrocardiogram. Now, this is basically the P wave. So the heart, this is one heartbeat, P wave, QRS, and then T wave. So this is electrocardiogram, ECG. Now, once the P wave uh, P wave is basically representing the depolarization of the atrium. Yeah, the atrium contracts. Once the atrium contracts, we can see all the way over here, the, the one with the yellow line, the atrial pressure increases. Why? Because the atrium contracts, number one. Once the atrium contracts, all of the blood will go to the ventricle, right? So we have over here the purple line, the ventricular volume is going to increase because the blood moves all the way from the atrium to the ventricle. So ventricular volume increases. And the ventricular pressure begins to increase a little bit because there are there's some blood in the ventricle. Now, once the blood is in the ventricle, all valves should close. Now the uh, uh, the uh, mitral valve, the tricuspid valve, all of the valves are going to close, which is going to cause for us isovolumic. Now everything is closed. Once everything is closed, we're going to have the ventricle is going to all the way pump the blood from the ventricle to the aorta. Now, once this blood is uh, pumped from the ventricle to the aorta, the ventricular volume. The QRS complex is going to happen, which means depolarization of the ventricle. Once this depolarization of the ventricle happens, that means you know, the ventricle pumps the blood all the way to the aorta, having very high ventricular pressure. The ventricular pressure is basically blue in color. So once the ventricular pressure is very high, that means all the blood is pumped from the ventricle to the aorta. So once the blood is in the aorta, that means the ventricle blood is the, vent the blood in the ventricle is very less because of that the ventricular volume significantly decreases. So ventricular pressure increases to pump the blood from the ventricle to the aorta, and the ventricular volume 
which uh, the ventricular blood uh, is basically decreasing in the ventricles. So this resembles why this uh, purple uh, uh, line is basically going down. Tamam. Now, what happens after that? After the ventricles and the aorta, this resembles the aortic pressure, which is orange over here, is basically increasing. Why? Because all of the blood is in the aorta. Tamam. And then after that, the T wave represents the repolarization of the ventricle. That means خلاص, the ventricle is going to relax. Tamam. Is it clear or it's not clear? Clear, one does. The arterial pressure, okay, I'll explain the arterial pressure. Basically, you said we have the P wave, it means that we have depolarization of the atrium. Depolarization of the atrium means that the atrium is going to contract. Now, once the atrium contracts, we can see all the way over here, it, the one that presents with A is basically the atrial pressure increases because the uh, uh, atrial uh, depolarization, the neural atria, is contracting. So once the atrial contracts, its pressure increases to send all the way the blood from the atrium to the ventricle. Because of that, we have over here the atrial pressure, which is in yellow, increases. Tamam. And then once all of the blood is in the ventricle, host, the pressure of the atrial decreases. Tamam. Does it make more sense? That's excellent. Any questions? Well, this is important, guys, and it's going to be repeated like uh, throughout your coming years, inshallah. Tamam. Excellent. Right. Right. So basically, we have this figure and the question. And basically, you can actually answer the question from the figure. But see, I need a question for like extra information. Feel free to read it, please. Okay, any guesses? By chance. Okay, bravo. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's explain it. So basically, we have this figure over here. Tamam. This figure, I'll just explain the next slide. Okay, so basically, this figure shows for us uh, the ventricular uh, pressure volume though. Now, the x-axis presents the volume and the y-axis presents the pressure. Now what happens is that first we will have over here, the, just imagine we have over here a line. So basically we have over here that once the ventricle has blood, the ventricular pressure is going to all the way in, uh, increase significantly. And then after that, we're going to have a, uh, a line over here, which means we're we going to have isovolumic, nothing like isovolumic, but basically everything is going to be equal. All valves are going to be closed. In this straight line, all valves are closed. And even in this line, all valves are closed. So basically, we will have over here, number one, the ventricular, uh, ventricular ventricles are going to be filled with blood. So its pressure is going to increase still here. Tamam? And then after that, once the uh, atrium pushes the blood all the way to the ventricle, all valves are going to close for some couple of seconds. And then this couple of seconds resemble the close, closure of all valves and increase in pleasure. Because of that, the line is going to be straight. It's not going to be like uh, any other line. Tamam? So, and then after that, once the valve of the, uh, once the uh, semilunar valve is going to open between the ventricle and the aorta, the ventricle is going to all the way push the blood from the ventricle to the aorta, increasing the pressure significantly, and then it's going to decrease over here because plus, the blood, most of the blood is already in the aorta. So the ventricular pressure is going to decrease. Tamam? And then after that, as we said, all valves are going to be closed. So we have over here, like, eyes of volumic. Everything is going to be closed. So straight line, we like we can have all the straight line, and then the cycle keeps on repeating itself with every level up of the heart. Tamam? So, this is basically just a very quick explanation of the ventricular uh, volume pressure loop. Now, in regards to this question, the exact same thing as we said over here, the red line is basically a normal ventricular uh, volume pressure loop. Tamam? And the blue thing is the abnormal, like the abnormality in this question. So, as we said over here, the ventricular volume uh, or uh, it's going to significantly increase come on, because of that we have increased in the line, and then after that, it's going to be all the way straight line because everything is visible. And then after that, the ventricle pressure is going to increase because it will push blood from the ventricles all the way to the aorta. So it's going to increase once most of the blood is in the aorta, the 
the particular pressure is going to decrease. And then after that, isovolumic, everything is stable, and then it keeps on repeating itself. Now, in this question, it shows you know, the battery can start to fill itself lately. As you can see over here, it starts on the way from the blue line. So usually it should start from 50. The ventricular volume starts from 50 all the way upwards. The amount, as you can end the solid volume, is going to be 50. The amount. So if it starts, uh, the ventricular volume starts from uh, this um, blue line, that means that there is abnormality in the heart or in the circulatory system in general. So basically, as our dear colleague uh, said, we basically have systemic hypertension. Because of this hypertension all the way in the aorta and in the, the arterial system in general, it causes the uh, uh, ventricles to fill lately. And the pressure over here increases significantly, very high. Like the ventricle need more pressure for it to push the blood all the way to the aorta. Because of that, this pressure significantly increases in the ventricle because it needs more pressure to uh, to accommodate the resistance that's coming all the way from the aorta for it to open the coronary valve the, uh, all the way to the aorta and push the blood to the aorta. And even when it pushes the blood to, to the aorta, very minimal amount of blood is going to go. As you can see, this curve is very small compared to this very big red curve. So this shows how significant the resistance and the uh, systemic uh, hypertension is in the body. And then after the ventricle all the way pushes the blood to the aorta, which is resembles in this thing and it's very minimal amount, it's going to all the way go back to its normal pressure. And as we said, this line is taller than this um, red line because the pressure is very high. So if we this very high pressure and resistance, we should increase the pressure very high for the aortic pressure, for the aortic uh, valve to open, or the semilunar valve to open, and then to close. Is it clear or am I clear? Alhamdulillah. If you guys have any questions, Hatta, I have my contact number as well as the news contact number. Just contact us anytime, anytime, anywhere, and inshallah, we're going to respond definitely to you. Okay? Like the Montaz. Okay. Will it be heart failure in a later, if, if this systemic uh, hypertension continues and the heart is already tired, so it couldn't pump anymore significantly, it can actually lead in a very later stage to heart failure. Come on, like it's one of the very latest stages. You are right. Come on. Okay. Is it clear? You guys, please have a bit to read the question and let's answer together. Exactly. So the correct answer is basically B. Why? So which of these uh, could be an opening snap that becomes louder with inspiration? Usually, anything is a opening snap is going to be both the tricuspid valve as well as the mitral valve. But once we once we see the word inspiration, inspiration mostly affects what the uh, right side. So it's going to be the, uh, it's going to be tricuspid. And if we see this thing, which is an abnormal thing, that means there's a stenosis to the tricuspid valve. And here we have this is an explanation of what I exactly said. Okay. So, next. Well, here we have this question. If you can kindly read an answer. Bravo. Allah, you guys are careful. I'm just, mashallah, careful. Most of your answers are correct. The correct answer is D. Let's see why. First of all, we have over here, there is a harsh homosystolic murmur. Once we hear homosystolic murmur, it's, it means either it's going to be the nutrient valve or the tricuspid valve, one of them. Tamam. And then we read the scenario to the end. So we found over here that there is a murmur in Afsari and in him. It repeats all the way where? To the left axilla. Now, what is closer to the left axilla? Is it the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve? Exactly, mitral valve, mitral valve. 
and usually if uh, if something and it's uh, here in the, in the left sternal border and usually if it relates also to the apex as this question correctly says over here it's found all the way in the apex so if here if we see the word apex plus left axilla and left sternal border this all of those things just take uh, give us hint that it's basically the mitral valve because mitral valve is the is the one that actually is directed to, like uh, radiates like uh, it's um, the love dub sound uh, the love sounds which, uh, like it already radiates to the apex tamam as well as the left axilla and the left sternal border is it clear? Very Jama. Next. Okay, so yeah, this question is easy. What do you guys think is the answer? Yeah, exactly. Careful. It's basically the third one. Why? Why? Basically, once a person, this question asks about the shock. Once person have has a shock, that means the blood pressure significantly is very decreased. So the first answer that hey, we remove it directly. It's systemic hypertension. No way the person has a shock and hypertension at the same time. So systemic hypertension is the very first thing that we're gonna remove from our mind and the plus shock. When I have hypertension, like hyper, the person is basically in hypertension. So number one, in regards to systemic hypertension, we remove it. Since the person is in shock, very, very low blood pressure, that means we're gonna have very weak pulses. Very weak pulses, and there's not enough blood that oxygenates the body organs, but we can have uh, cool extremities, not warm extremities, and there's no significant amount of blood uh, like oxygenate the body. So what, what are we gonna have a shock? Is a? Guys, what are we What are we not gonna have in a shock answer? Exactly, bravo. We're gonna have system, we're, it's impossible to have systemic hypertension because, as we said, in a shock, we're gonna have hypotension, that means very low blood pressure, very low blood pressure. Yeah, and we're gonna have very weak pulses, very cool extremities, and the kidney, the heart, the kidney, manaha is that we have very uh, low amount of breathing, okay? Very high amount of breathing, high, very high amount of breathing. The body is trying to comp compensate itself and it tries to uh, breathe very fast. The mom? Clearly, Jama, I feel uh, like it's a little bit confusing. So, will I repeat? Okay, okay, mashallah. Okay, next question. Exactly, blah, blah, blah. the correct answer is D. Why? Which is not a major mechanism of the oxygen delivery to the tissues. Like oxygen delivery is important for blood volume, صح? for cardiac performance, صح? for vascular tone. It's true, coronary perfusion is also important, but it's not as significant as the uh, rest of the answers. You guys all correct, uh, got it correct? Uh, okay, next question. Mind you read it, and uh, if you have an answers. Okay, some people say D, some people say C. Uh, the correct answer is actually D. 
because all of you are careful, mashallah. So let's explain why some people even say being tight. So basically, we have over here a 30 year old woman experiencing tachycardia, and Mohim, she has a, a, a carotid lesion. Now, where is the carotid? Basically, the carotid the artery is all the way in the neck, right? We have like the right and the left carotid arteries. Tamam. So, usually, as we know, the aorta has better receptor. What's the function of this better receptor? Once it feels that we have very high blood pressure, it's going to all the way do vasodilation and like it does a couple of things. Like the end result is to decrease this hypertension because we don't want the patient, person to experience hypertension and go to like more complications of this hypertension. Tamam. So we have over here, as we said, a 13 year old woman experiencing tachycardia, and she did massage to this carotid region. Now, this actually massage uh, to the carotid region of her neck, which quickly reduces the heart rate. Now, the question is that how this heart rate is actually reduced? As we said, because the aorta has this very receptor. Better receptor function is to decrease the blood pressure. How? By doing vasodilation and uh, just compensatory mechanisms. Now, once she did massage to her carotid. Uh, to her carotid uh, region or to her carotid artery, this actually stimulates the barrier receptor to do the um, hypertension, like it inhibits the hypertension to be all the way happening and it decreases the hypertension from happening. Yeah, and we have HBT, it does vasodilation, uh, it does like those things to prevent hypertension. Now, in regards to its mechanism, it's basically that we have increased afferent. Uh, afferent, uh, afferent uh, nerves that all the way go to the nucleus tractus solitary. A nucleus tractus solitary is responsible for the homeostasis of our bodies. Tamam? So yeah, once we this, uh, once we, once this lady oh, has done the such a carotid artery, it basically stimulates the better receptor. Once the better receptor st is stimulated, it goes all the way by the afferent nerve fiber to the nucleus tractus solitary. So please, I have high blood pressure. Try to decrease it in any way. So a negative feedback mechanism goes all the way. Better receptor, please decrease blood pressure by doing vasodilation and other uh, mechanisms to decrease the blood pressure and decrease the hypertension from happening. So this, this is what actually the, the lady has done. And the correct answer, as we said, is increased afferent firing from better receptors to the nucleus tractus solitary. Is it clear? Okay, bravo. Any questions so far, guys? And I'm done with my part, and right now Ibrahim is going to start. So do you have any question for me? No, mashallah. If you guys have any question, anytime, just find the I'll tool, like about tool, so an email or, uh, or on my mobile number, and inshallah, I'll be more than happy to help. Okay? Good luck, everyone. Inshallah, see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, can you guys hear me? All right, I think you can. Assalamu alaikum. Now, all this has happened because uh, we didn't know you guys had a review session at three. So, we did it at four, and Bala has a session at five, an elective. So, we had compromise a bit. She did her part at the beginning, and I'm going at the end. Okay, go for the mood, let's go. Hi. Okay. You guys are saying this is B. I hate to break it for you, but the answer is not B. Let me explain. Look, he's telling you there is no P wave. And recall, guys, from your lecture, what was P wave for? Exactly, atrial contraction. So which node will do the atrial contraction? Where, where does it start from? SA node, right? Exactly. So if this man has no P wave and they want to get a machine to fix that, this means they're replacing what part? The SA node, which is doing the P wave, right? That makes sense, right? I need yes or all those. Great. I see a yes. That's nice. So you have to think about this way. Great. Let's go. Next.
That's correct. Mashallah. I didn't even need to explain. Like you guys said, yeah, that's correct. Let's record. Next, let's go. Wow, the diversity of the answers is great. A, C, D, wow. Okay, let's think about it. Because this is just about thinking. Now, when I tell you that the electrical axis is deviated to the left, this means there's a stronger power to the left that's getting the axis fluid. And when I say left, is that left ventricle or right ventricle? I mean, I think it's left. Right, it's left. Now, when will the left ventricle be more powerful, contract more? Pulmonary cirrhosis or aortic cirrhosis? Aortic. I'm not gonna tell you what the answer is. Now you tell me what's the answer. C. Great job. So all you have to do is run the hypothetical through your brain. Pulmonary is on the right, that's correct. And if there is pulmonary cirrhosis, the axis will deviate to the left or the right if there is pulmonary cirrhosis. Right. Good job. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And now let's see. Here's what's happening. Left ventricle hypertrophy. It will go. Let me put the uh, one second. Where's the thing? Pointer options. Yes, there's a look at the left. The stronger power will get the axis to it. If it's right, that's it. Easy, right? Okay, next. I mean, it's definitely not normal. And you can see that there's a problem with the P waves. They're looking weird. So it's atrial flutter. It's the atrial part, which is the P wave, is fluttering, as you can see. It's weird. We can move, right? Guys, if you have any questions, just stop me anytime. Okay, next. I'll give you guys time to calculate. Did you guys get any answers? It's fine, it's fine. 
if you guys did not calculate it, I will do it with you. If you did, just give me the answer. Okay, it's fine, it's fine. No problem. I will calculate it with you. Okay. I'm not gonna show you the answer. You don't have to calculate it first. Let's do it together. Who is asking about the sort volume? Can someone send me the sort volume formula? If you know the formula, you will get the answer. That's one. What's another way? There's another formula. The pulse pressure over the sum of the diastolic and systolic. You're very close, by the way. CO over HR, that's right. Cardiac output over the heart rate. And we already have the heart rate, which is the pulse. So this is 75. Is that right? You agree. But how do we get the cardiac output? The cardiac output, it has another equation. Is that right? Do you remember the equation where it says oxygen consumption over arterial oxygen minus venous oxygen? Exactly. Fix equation. And I got it from your slides, by the way. So this is the equation. I just said it, but I'll show you here. Just a second. Yeah, there you go. Cardiac output over heart rate. And cardiac output is rate of consumption over arterial minus venous oxygen. It's from your slides. So now we go back. Let's apply. So we got 250 over 0 0.2 minus 0 0.15, 0 0.20 minus 0 0.3. Now this is the cardiac output. If you guys calculate this, I'm not sure how, how much is it, but calculate it. It should be like 5,000. I think yeah, it is 5,000. Now, insert the cardiac output to this equation. So 5,000 over 75, exactly. Now, how much would that be? Approximately 56. 0.7. You'll get like 6.6 6. 6, uh, something. It's approximately 6.6.7. 6. And that's how we calculate it. And now you've learned how to calculate one of the hardest equations for me. I mean, this is quite tough. I don't think you'll get something in the exam that's this level. Okay, we can move on. Do you guys have any questions? If you guys did not get it or something, I can repeat for you. All clear, that's perfect, that's perfect. This indeed is permanent view. How did it happen? Okay. Some of you said A, some of you said E. Now, I, I know how you thought about this. A and E, they both cause fluid going outside, but you're a doctor, right? 
someone comes in with pulmonary edema and his symptoms are this, this, that, written down. And you see this pulmonary edema in the X-ray. Do you think it has anything to do with oncotic pressure? Did you find any liver problems? And from your slides, the doctor mentioned that when there is liver problems, you will find increased capillary fluid, oncotic pressure, edema. But pulmonary edema is usually exactly right heart failure. It's secondary to right heart failure. Hence, the pressure in the pulmonary capillaries will increase. So the answer will be, now you tell me. Any answers? There you go. Exactly, E. Thank you. And this is the slide I got it from. As you can see, people who said that uh, plasma proteins cause edema, that's correct, but not in pulmonary edema. There's another slide that says when there is liver cirrhosis, you will find edema that's due to less oncotic pressure. That's cool. Okay. Do you have any questions? I'm ready to explain. No questions? That's perfect. Then we'll move on. Next question. Okay, let's see the answer. I want to know why you guys say C. Like, it's fine, just let me know. Maybe you, you might be correct, right? But I just think it's C. I mean, we can debate. <laughs> okay. So, this man sliced his arm. I mean, what an accident. But he's just sliced it, right? Yes. Vasoconstriction. Why? Now, when the blood is leaving, the blood pressure is going down. That makes sense, right? And when the blood pressure goes down, your body needs to get it back up because it's not good for you to have low blood pressure. That will cause some ischemic problems. Now your body will do something smart. Your body is smart, subhanAllah. It will increase the heart rate to increase the output. And it will also constrict the vessels to increase the pressure in the vessels. But also the kidney will help you. It will increase renin. Now we said that the heart rate will increase, but the heart can also do another thing, which is increase the contractility. And that's how your body is going to save you. So increase, 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 increase. Good job. Next question. Wait, before we go to the next question, someone asked a question. I love when someone asks a question. Why does resistance increase? Okay, brother, look. Now you're losing blood. Uh, not you, I mean, this guy is losing blood. When you lose blood, the blood volume goes down. When the blood volume goes down, the blood pressure goes down. Now the vessel is like this. Okay, you can see. So it's empty. It's like very low. And when the vessel is empty, the pressure is low. How can we fill the blood vessel? We cannot just produce more blood at the moment. So instead we can constrict the vessel. When the vessel is constricted, Resistance goes up because now the vessel is more resistant to the flow, you know, because it's constricting. Does that make sense, my friend? If not, I can repeat. That's perfect. We can move on then. 
Vamos cá, Tuiás. Okay. This is a previous exam question. And a lot of people had struggles with it. But you won't, because I'm explaining it to you. Look at this. A lot of you just say A, C, B. So I'm not going to reveal the answer now. I'm going to explain something. And you are, guys are going to tell me the correct answer. And you're going to get it correctly. Okay. So we know. Uh, one second, let me put the pen. Okay. This is the vessel. This is the interstitium or the tissue, and this is the lymphatic. Let's take A, B, C, D and apply them. Decreased capillary hydrostatic pressure. This means the pressure here is decreased. Can you see the pen? Wait. Here, it's decreased. So if there is no enough pressure, fluid is not going to leave. And the fluid is not going to leave, the lymph flow is not going to get affected. It's not going to increase, right? Because the fluid is inside, because there is no hydrostatic pressure to push it out to the lymph vessel. Now, increase interstitial hydrotoxic pressure. When we increase the pressure in the interstitial, the interstitial will apply pressure on the blood vessel, so the blood vessel will not push the fluid out. Still, lymph flow is not going to be affected. What about C? Decreased colloid interstitial fluid. The colloid in the interstitium is decreased. Okay. This means that the pressure here is decreased. So the vessel can push fluid out. Then the lymphatic vessel can pick this fluid and increase its flow. Wait, it's, it's C, guys. Uh, this is a mistake from me. It's uh, C, guys. Let me just uh, fix it, I'm sorry. Okay. Now we're here. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, doctor. Um, I have a Someone question. Have a question? Yes. Yeah. I wanted to ask, so does this mean that it goes from a region of high pressure to low pressure? That's exactly what's happening. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Okay, then. Now we'll move on. Calculation. Okay, you guys are answering, and that's absolutely right. Now, this is the equation, and the answer is C. Simply, simply, very simple. I'm going to explain it in 10 seconds. Okay, speed run, one, two, three, go. This is pressure out, right? This 
it's special out because it's negative. Now we have 27. Now this is special in to the vessel. So it's minus 28. Now this is also special out, right? Because it's pulling it out. That's 3, 30, because it's 3 and 27. Now minus 28, and that's 2. I thought that in 10 seconds. Did you guys catch up with me? I know I did it too fast, but did you guys get it? Because most of you have tried, so I don't think I need to go over it again. Oh no, I'm not coming, doctor. Still three more or four years, I don't know. I can't count. Okay, perfect, great job. Now this is the graph you love. I got two questions from this. Give it a shot, I'm waiting. Wow. I mean, you guys told me the graph was tough, but I did not know you were professionals like this. Okay, you're absolutely correct. Now, some, someone said it's something else. So I'll just explain it really quick and tell you what happened here. Now, this is, I can call it a little bit of recall because you can find a slide where it tells you what happens on every segment of the graph. So positive anotropic, it means the contractility is up. So you increase cardiac contractility. Now you remember from Dr. Simon's slides that when the cardiac output, uh, uh, sorry, cardiac uh, graph, not the venous, there's venous and there's a cardiac. When the cardiac uh, graph goes up, this means the contraction increased, which is polycythonotropic. I'll show you the slide once we finish the next question, because the next question is also a graph. I'll explain the whole graph then. Okay, answer. Okay. Someone said D, D, B, C, E. All right, you, said, you guys said everything. Did, did someone say N, M, N? Say them, no. I'm not making fun of you guys. I'm just, the answers for some are very boring. So we need to think about this. Let's think together. Stay with me. Now, this supplement increases cardiac contactility. This means the cardiac graph, let me draw, you know what, let me draw. So the cardiac graph, if it's like this, it's gonna become like this. This is positive inotropic or increased contractility, which has solved the question like this. So now we know that the cardiac graph is going to go up. What about decrease arteriolar tone? This will affect which graph, cardiac or venous? Venus, absolutely. So this Venus graph, wait, let me draw. This is the Venus graph. If we increase the tone, it's gonna stay on the same point, X axis, it's gonna go to the right. You imagine that? Now let's apply what we just said to the graph. Where is the star? Okay, the star is here. So, cardiac 
if the activity increased, we go up one, and the arterial tone is decreased. So we go one up, but we're still on the same point for the venous graph. Now the answer is, I didn't say it yet. I want more people to say the answer, more, more people. More, more, more. Yes, yes. MashaAllah, the Kasra. There you go. It's be absolutely correct. Now you understand how to interpret this graph. Now let's go to Dr. Simon's slide. Absolutely beautiful slide. I mean, you see a lot of lines and stuff, but it's so beautiful. Just take one point and trace it. What we just solved was like this. And look, decrease arterial tone. So the vessel, blood vessel, the artery, will constrict, sorry, will dilate, because you decrease it. So what happens? The cardiac output increases. But if you constrict it, cardiac output decreases. And you can display however you want with this graph. Now, before I move on from this graph, because I know this graph is a bit of a hassle, does anyone have any question about this graph? Anything? Try me. Any question? You can ask me now, later, whatever you want, but I will answer you, inshallah. Before I move on. I'll give you some time to think. The converging lines. Uh, what do you mean by the converging lines? Can you please explain? Does decrease return, increase venous return? That's a good question. And there's another question for the tone, why they come to one point. Okay, both of you are asking the same question, and it's a very good question. I'll tell you why. So one guy asked, or one student asked, the converging point, which is this. Why does it stick to the same point? Another one asked, does decreasing arterial tone increase venous return? Now, the answer is yes, right? Because look, when we went to the right, what happened to the point? It's higher now. So the venous return is increased. What about the other question? What says, why is it on the same point? And that's a good question. I asked it last year. And I did not find an answer until recently. Why does it go here, not here, for example? I'll tell you why. It's a very cool concept. Look, let me draw. Let me draw. I like drawing, you know, the drill and everything. So this is the artery. Okay. Here is the venous. Here is the heart. This one's for you guys. The heart pumps out. Now, you say, I want to constrict it. Let's constrict it. You constrict the heart. Uh, the, sorry, the vessel. Now, the right atrial pressure, you will say, oh, it will increase. But I'll tell you, no, not, not exactly. Maybe eventually. And it's a con it's conceptual graph, if you think about it. Now, when it's constricted, there's this output. And the veins will be receiving less blood. So, does that mean the atrial pressure will change? I'll tell you, no. Because what's controlling the atrial pressure? It's the veins. And when we think about a concept, we say that this happens, for example, we decrease arterial tone, keeping in mind that no cardiac kind of changes are going to happen. So yes, eventually, eventually, there will be a change in the atrial pressure, but not on the graph. Because on the graph, we think about direct changes. So when we constrict the vessel, what directly changes after this? It's the cardiac output. The veins, they can accommodate, they can control the atrial pressure like they want. So what controls the atrial pressure? The veins. What controls the cardiac output? The arteries. You guys get this concept. But in vascular science, what you're learning basically, eventually everything will affect everything. It's just that what's directly happening and what not. You get this? I know it's a very weird concept. Today I was discussing it with my seniors, my friends, and it's quite a um, weird concept, but it's very fun to understand what I'm saying. You guys get the point. 
So in summary, because I, I talked a lot in summary, eventually, yes, change might happen, but it won't because the veins, they can accommodate blood or push blood. So who's controlling the atrial pressure? The veins. But when we directly or, or look to direct changes, what will change when we constrict the vessel is the heart, cardiac output. That makes sense? Amazing. If you have any questions, I am always open to answering in person, phone, email, whatever. Okay, we can move on now. Okay, uh, before I start, I need more answers. More answers, guys, drop them in the chat. Answers, guys. Go ahead. Even if it's wrong, make a mistake now and not in the exam. Okay. Enough answers. Now let me explain. I will explain, and as I'm explaining, I want you to guess the right answer. An educated, nice. Yes. Okay. Actually, you know that we got this question, like a very similar question last year, and like very few people got it right. But you guys, you will get it absolutely right. Look at this. So you're a doctor, you're sitting, and the guy comes into your hospital, inshallah, and he has high blood pressure. Like it's elevated. Like what's wrong with this guy? And you find that he has a renal vascular hypertension. So there is high pressure in the vessels going to the kidney. You check, check on some results and you find he has stenosis in the left kidney. Now, no, this is still cardio, it's not renal. But look at this. If the left kidney has stenosis, this means blood flow to the kidney is high or low. I want you to tell me it's low. Does everyone agree that when the left kidney is stenosed, the flow is low? I mean, everyone's saying low, so this means you agree. Okay. What does the kidney do when there is low blood flow? Like the kidney, when it sees low blood flow, like, oh, I need to release something. And that is exactly RIAS or RAS, whatever you call it. Renin, angiotensin, etc. You know this. Now, now, look at this concept, very cool concept. Although you have no problem in your blood pressure, but the stenosis in the kidney will make the kidney think that there is low flow and low pressure. What will the kidney do now? Release the RAS system, more renin, and more aldosterone, right? Because the renal plasma flow is low, but the body systemic pressure is normal. So the renal is increasing the pressure because it just thinks that there is no flow, where is, I mean, the flow is normal in the body. I'll say this again, and I summarized nice few sentences. So, exactly, it's G. The answer, let me reveal the answer. That's G. 
Okay, look. So the kidney, it's like a controller. It does not know what's outside. It knows what's inside, which is in the kidney. It's like a, a little bit selfish. When there is no flow to the kidney, the kidney will secrete stuff, then in aldosterone, angiotensin, etc., to increase the pressure because it thinks that this is a problem in the whole body. But when you trick the kidney by decreasing the flow in the kidney only, it will start also secreting renin aldosterone angiotensin, which will increase the pressure everywhere else in the normal places. And that's why renal stenosis, hypertension, you know the problem now. You'll be a good doctor, inshallah. And when you get this question, you will not be tricked like I did. Believe it or not, I got this question wrong. I mean, it was during the exam and I was stressed and I was not thinking straight, but now we're learning, right? We're thinking straight. You guys now know how to think about this question. I was surprised, not gonna lie. But you guys understand? Wow, perfect, perfect. Let's go next. MashaAllah, someone already answered. Another one, another one, another one. MashaAllah. Yes, love it. You guys thought about this question in a nice way. Let's think about it together. A person stands up really quickly. The veins, sorry, the blood is going to pool in the veins and the leg. So, increase. Venous is like pressure. Parasympathetic activity will want to decrease to push the veins to push the blood. Is that right? You agree? Made blood flow because you stood up, it's going down. And that's just the question, you know, it's like very easy. By the way, this question is not identified as easy. Like it's sorted from the good level questions. And you guys answering this fast, I mean, you're the doctor, not me. Next question. More answers and think. Take a step by step, think and shoot. I will not say the answer, but I will think for you and you will think with me. Look. You go to the gym, you pull this weight, you start doing your biceps. What do you think will happen in the artery, in the biceps? Will it dilate or constrict? Okay, why constrict? Does your bicep need more blood or less blood? Exactly, dilate. So if you need more blood, the artery will expand or dilate. Diameter will increase. So we got that one right. Increase. So let's eliminate the others. Yeah, exactly. Arterial is artery. Let's eliminate the others. Because for the biceps, it's working out. We need to push more oxygen and blood. Now, what is adenosine? You guys heard of ATP. What happens when ATP is broken down? You're training your biceps, right? Train, train, train. What will happen to ATP? 
start going down. Now, adenosine is the waste product of ATP. Will it increase or decrease and why? Wait, don't tell me the answer. I want you to think with me. Increase. That's because you're using ATP, breaking it down, and adenosine is being released as a waste product. So we eliminate this and this. Correct? Let's go to tissue metabolism. You're working your biceps. Okay. Will your biceps metabolize more or less? I want an answer. Why more? Because you're exercising your biceps. It needs more energy. It will metabolize more. Adenosine does not help with the metabolism. But when you break down ATP, adenosine is released as a waste product, recycled, and then put back in the tissues. You get this? Now, tissue metabolism, we said more or less. More. So, more tissue metabolism, more adenosine, because we're breaking down ATP, and that arterial diameter is increasing because we're dilating. So what's the answer, guys? I mean, I think it's A. Do you agree with me? See, you all got it right. Does anyone still not get why? Okay. Why more tissue metabolism? Okay. Metabolism is when you break down, for example, glucose, to ATP, pyruvate, etc. That's correct. Now you're walking down to your muscle. Do you need your bicep to break down more glucose and stuff to give you energy? Or you want it not to do that? What do you think will happen in the muscle? I mean, the muscle is a tissue, so that's what they mean by tissue metabolism. You know, when you work out, they tell you you're burning more calories. What do they mean by burning more calories? Your metabolism is going up as a result of your working out or exercising or whatever. Exactly, you need for energy. That's exactly what's happening. So as I, as I said, you work out, you need more oxygen. Diameter expands, increases. Adenosine is a waste product of ATP. You're using ATP. Adenosine will increase. You need energy. What do our body do for energy? Metabolism. Increase. And that's how you ask this question. Does anyone have any question? I'm glad to ask any question you guys have. Clear, okay. Guys, it's fine. Ask, don't hesitate, please. I would love to explain. Okay. I need more clears then. I don't like this. I need like clear, clear, clear spam. Do you guys get it? Yes, clear, clear, more, more, more. Perfect. That's perfect. Thank you so much, guys. And wait, wait. We conclude. That's it for today's session. I want to tell you guys some words from heart. Allah of fikkum. That's the first thing. Now, practice as much as you can after you're done studying. As you all know, practice makes perfect. And if in today's session, you didn't get the questions right, that's fine. Now you make mistakes, but later you don't. So if you made a mistake now in a question, you're not going to do it again later on. That's Something to keep your heads up. And that's it. If you have any questions, reach me out or ask me right now. Or if you see me at the hallway, just scream.